Well, hope you guys are doing well today as you watch this. Um, I'm recording it early in the morning, April 23rd. So and that's the day I also am assigning this. So uh, for two questions, like we've done every time for the last several times, is uh, put something famous that happened on this day in history, something important from this day in history, April 23rd, and a famous person born on this day in history. Uh, remember, as we discussed um, yesterday, continue, make sure you choose the person you're going to uh, write on for your Oklahoma biography uh, and get that to me uh, by this Saturday. So that would be the 25th. Um, so a couple days, granted, that should take you a couple minutes once you decide to just look into it. It's not, not gonna take you very long. I don't need any other information about the person, just the person's name. We're gonna continue where we left off with notes last time. We talked about the first land run was where we left off. Some of the towns that uh, built up after that. Um, well, that obviously leads to the need for some sort of organized government inside of Oklahoma territory. Because for about the first year after the first land run, uh, some of the towns might have had you know a mayor or somewhat organized government but there was no government for the entire territory so the u.s government in uh, 1890 on may 2nd passes the organic act for the territory of oklahoma uh, which included all the land west of the five tribes including no man's land in fact um you don't have to but i actually would suggest you would look at your map on page uh, 305 you can if you don't have your book, you can get that right now and check that out real quick. But it shows a pretty good picture of what Oklahoma Territory looked at, like at this point in time. The majority of the western part of the state, even some of the central part of the state, uh, a lot of the northern part, but you, the Cherokee Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and some other much smaller tribes way in the northeastern corner still had their lands. But the rest of the lands uh, were part of Oklahoma Territory, including the lands of several different Indian tribes. So once again, that's on page. 305. Well, this organic act um, said that the president, and this is the president of the United States, would appoint uh, the governor of Oklahoma Territory. He would appoint a secretary and three Supreme Court judges. This would be state Supreme Court judges. Uh, then the citizens could elect a 13 member council and a 26 member House of Representatives to represent them. Uh, the legislature would meet no more than 60 days every two years, except for the first session, which could last 120 days, considering they have to do a lot of work to establish this new territory. This act also established seven counties uh, in the territory of Oklahoma. Well, in sorry, in Indian Territory um, or, or Oklahoma. It would be called Oklahoma by now. Those seven counties here, Guthrie, Oklahoma City, Norman, El Reno, Kingfisher, Stillwater, and Beaver City. Uh, and since Oklahoma Territory did not have their own laws yet, that they would operate under Nebraska laws um, until they could create their own laws. So eventually it would, would work under Oklahoma laws, but they would have to act under Nebraska laws originally. In 1896, <clears throat> they added Greer County uh, as a part of Oklahoma Territory uh, between the Red River and its North Fork territory. Uh, so this was close to the uh, border of Texas. That is on the map on page 305, if you're looking at it way in the southwest corner of Oklahoma. Uh, no man's land, which is the Oklahoma Panhandle, had been somewhat of an island or kind of a buffer between Texas and Kansas. Uh, it also was part of uh, Oklahoma territory as well. And people who lived there gained Homestead rights when it was officially made a part of Oklahoma Territory in 1890. So it was it was made a part right away because uh, it was uh, one of the parts that was added to um, the Oklahoma Territory quickly. The homestead rights just means simply people could settle there and they could do that five year plan if they could make developments, build build upon it, farm upon it, then that land could become theirs. <clears throat> well. Let's get specifically to who were the first people chosen by uh, the president at that point in time, who was President Harrison. Um, George W. Steele, who was from Indiana, was chosen to be the territorial governor. Many people felt the president was carpet bagging or returning a political favor 
Now you're like carpet bagging. What's that mean? Uh, we'll talk about this in uh, U.S. history next year or two uh, after the Civil War. But a carpet bagger uh, was typically someone who took advantage of political favors. Uh, but they were given the name carpet bagging. Uh, and in this case, George W. Steele doesn't really fit the definition very well. But they, most of them are referred to people who went into the South, who were from the North after the Civil War, and who were trying to bring Northern ideas there. And they carried their, their luggage in a bag made out of old carpet, uh, which would be kind of a cheap bag. Um, so it's not really a, a positive term to be called a carpet bagger. Um, so the president was accused of being a carpet bagger by returning a political favor to George W. Steele by making him governor. Robert Martin, um, an ex-Union soldier, soldier west of Oklahoma City, uh, was named territorial secretary. Other appointments were Horace Speed of Guthrie as U.S. District Attorney, Warren G. Lurdy of Virginia as a U.S. Marshal. And you might be like, that's not the name you have on here. Well, that's because he was he soon resigned and was succeeded by William Grime Kingfisher. So some of these people came obviously from the territory, but George W. Steele did not. They also assigned their, their first three Supreme Court judges for the state. Uh, Governor Steele arrived in Guthrie on May 23rd, 1890, and soon traveled throughout the territory to meet the people. Uh, a variety of political groups were represented in the territory. In addition to the Republican and Democratic Party, there was a Farmers Alliance Party and the Greenback Party and the People or Populists Party. Uh, there also was some Socialist Party members represented in the United, in Oklahoma Territory as well. Uh, the Populist Party would actually be, you know, during this time period, uh, probably the most prominent third party in the United States. Um, in in some, some ways, though, the Populist Party and the Democrat Party eventually meld into one, becomes a part of the Democrat Party a little bit later. Uh, Governor Steele called for an election on August 5th um, to elect the territorial legislature. The new legislature met for the first time August 27th um, of 1890. The contract was signed with Kansas to place Oklahoma prisoners in the penitentiaries in Lansing, Kansas. So since Oklahoma didn't have their own prisons, any prisoners would be sent to Kansas. Um, one of the things we're going to be talking about is uh, Oklahoma quickly wanted to establish public schools. And the Organic Act appropriated $50,000 for schools and reserved section 16 and 36 of each township for the use of a benefit to public schools. Uh, and you can see that on these numbers. But basically, um, this is something that would be common of townships during this time period, not just in Oklahoma, but across the United States. You would set your townships up in a grid pattern. They would consist of 36 one mile square parcels called sections. Each section contained 640 acres of land. So as you're looking at this township, each one of those numbers represents 640 acres. So each one's a pretty big, big area. This would be uh, 36 miles by 36 miles. Uh, well, sorry, it'd be uh, six mile squares by six mile squares. So it'd be 36 square miles, this whole area would be. And like I was saying, public schools would be established in section 16 and section 36. Section 33 was set aside to support public schools um, and public buildings and correctional facilities. Section 13 was designated to provide support for educational institutions. Uh, and then other areas would be, you know, kind of divvied up in other different ways. Um, so public schools obviously was something that was quickly uh, added to, and this is kind of what the Indians did too, if you remember when they came right away, they, they emphasized education. Uh, so as a teacher, I know I, you obviously know I think education is incredibly important, but you can see in these early societies as they moved west, school was one of the first things they wanted to establish um, because uh, educated population is a very important part to a succeeding society. So um, I'm, I'm glad we have a great school system in the United States today. Um, they did start to separate schools for white and for black children, uh, or they could provide mixed schools, uh, but most areas chose to segregate schools to some degree, which was happening in America during this time period. It would continue, unfortunately, for a while after this. 
they started what were called normal schools. These would be schools where teachers would be trained. We also had the establishment of two new universities, the university in Norman, which today obviously is known as OU, uh, and the Agri Agricultural and Mechanical College, uh, which was in Stillwater, of course, where that uh, ended up being called. It eventually became known as Oklahoma State University. And like I said, they established normal schools, which sounds weird just to say the name of the school is a normal school, but that is where they once again uh, trained teachers. Uh, initially, the capital was in Guthrie, and they paved the way for it to stay there for a while. Uh, some people were trying to get the uh, capital to be removed, moved to Oklahoma City or to Kingfisher, but Governor Steele uh, vetoed those and kept the capital in Guthrie. Um, there would be more land openings throughout the 1890s. The last land run was May 23rd, 1895. There were seven land runs in all. Uh, each was done a little bit differently and opened up different lands. I'm not going to go through each one of them. Um, some of them might have a different way you would claim your land, but still you have the same homesteading process after those land runs. Um, some of these, you know, we, there was actually a stock market crash in 1893, uh, which brought a lot of publicity. An estimated 100,000 took part in the land run then when 6 million acres were located open to so this would be in later 1893 because since so many people maybe lost money because the stock market crashed they were looking for um some better way of life so they came out to oklahoma for that particular land run. but like i said the final one may 23rd 1895 uh, which was probably the smallest of the land runs to be held this was while grover cleveland was president of the united states um some future territorial governors. Now, I'm not going to go over all of them. There were several territorial governors before Oklahoma becomes a state. Um, of note, I did want to mention William Renfro was the only Democrat territorial governor during the territorial phase of Oklahoma history. Otherwise, the rest were all um, Republicans. So Steele was a Republican. All the other governors were, except for William Renfro. Um, Territorial schools were established during Renfro's administration. Um, another no normal school was established then as well. Two universities were established, two other ones besides those first two. A little bit later, uh, between 1897 and 1901, under a different governor. Um, the final territorial governor, the last territorial governor was Frank Franz, a former postmaster and Osage Indian agent. He led the territory into statehood, uh, and we'll get to that. Obviously, uh, that's not something we're going to cover this chapter, <clears throat> but Theodore Roosevelt is president uh, during the time period, and Frank Franz uh, is the territorial governor for that last, that last period, uh, while Oklahoma remains a territory before it's a state. Now, there were last land distributions, you may be saying, but he just talked about the last land runs, but this is not done by a land run. Uh, they decided to use a different uh, allotment procedure uh, to do the sale of the surplus lands here called the Big Pasture. <clears throat> they began opening these lands August 6th of 1901. <clears throat> uh, to improve the land opening method, the 3.5 million acres were distributed by a lottery. Um, now, <clears throat> it's not going to be quite just like <coughs> A lottery that you would think of, but it would be that your name would basically be put into a, a list and they would pull names out. Um, homesteaders would register at a land office in, in a couple different locations. 87,000 people registered in the Lawton office and 78,000 signed up in El Reno. So we're looking at over 150,000 people signing up to get available quarter sections of land beginning August 6th, 1901. Each land office randomly drew 125 registration cards each day, and each card numbered consecutively It was as it was drawn. Uh, so they would draw 125 a day. If you were the first person drawn that day, you had the first choice of land. Second person had the second choice of land. So you kind of got to choose where you wanted to settle, uh, but it would be at random. You wouldn't um, necessarily win. 
Once again, a lot of these people did not get, but some do decide to settle in Oklahoma regardless. Um, one thing is I wanted to talk about is you had the continued process of getting the Indians, uh, the different Native American tribes to accept allotment in Oklahoma territory, you know, the individual ownership of land by individuals instead of by tribal ownership, which pretty much every tribe did. The Osage did that as well. However, the Osage tribe did do something a little bit different. Uh, they retained as a tribe the mineral rights to their land. Now, if you guys know much about the Osage, they've become very wealthy off of oil. So it kind of makes sense uh, that the tribe itself became wealthy because the individuals didn't own the land, but the tribe did. So that was actually pretty unique because most of the tribes did not do that and retain mineral rights. Instead, each individual uh, got the mineral rights for the land that they were on. Um, you also did have uh, some final lands that were um, uh, sold instead of even done through lottery. So that's that's kind of a typical thing where people would uh, buy the land to finish up all the rest of the lands on the big pasture. Uh, they were sold in 160 acre tracks. Uh, Five million was received from all those sales, uh, which helped fund uh, the Kiowa and Comanche and Apache tribes to set aside some of the lands. Uh, they were given to those tribes who had given up their lands. So um, that's it for notes today. It was a shorter notes, at least I think it is. I, I haven't timed it right now, but it seems like it was shorter. Uh, but we finished this chapter. Uh, next week, we will start looking at Oklahoma becoming a state. Pretty big moment. Uh, I do want you to answer one last question today uh, on your notes, and that is, what is your favorite fast food place? Favorite fast food place? Man, I don't even have an answer. I, I wish I did at this point in time. You're like, well, Mr. Odell's not answering. Um, for one, it's kind of hard to define. If you consider Smash Burger a fast food place, I would say that it is, but that might be considered like an in-between a fast food and a sit-down restaurant. Um, otherwise, it's pretty hard to choose, but think about it. Choose a fast food restaurant uh, and hope you guys are doing well. We'll be talking to you guys later.